Hello everyone, happy to announce that the Shingu book is finally ready for pre-orders and that sometime this June of 2023 the first copies will go out to customers in Asia, Europe and North America. If you want to pre-order the book, please write me an email from the link in the description. To me, the Shingu is the most exciting river in South America. No other place has this incredible diversity and clear enough water to actually see the fish. This place is unique, and the fish that have adapted to live in the hundreds of rapids of the river make up this dynamic, always-in-motion community that will captivate anyone that has seen it. Dr. Leandro Sosa and I have spent more than five years photographing Shingu below water and writing a book that will introduce all of the Shingu's major habitats, most important species, and give you information that you cannot find anywhere else. If you're only going to buy one fish book this year, make it this one. In the coming month, I will show some of the best video scenes from the expeditions. I want to show some of the moving pictures of our favorite moments in the river, like this drone flight over the Iriri River Rapids. This shows the incredible complexity of the substrates. This complexity, combined with sunlight penetrating the clear and shallow water, provided the habitat and nutrients for the river's fish diversity to evolve. The Shingu's black stingrays are found right here in the rapids, sometimes even in shallow water. And you can see in this video that this black pattern with white spots is maybe bad camouflage over sand, but over all these crazy nice granite and conglomerate substrates and pebbled gravels in every color, the pattern actually works. Rays can of course handle the strong currents easily. Plecos are everywhere in the Shingu, and often you just see them swimming away, like this big Scobinancistris aureatus. These guys live in places with conglomerates and gravel substrates. You can see every pebble is a different color here, and those big scobies eat snails and other invertebrates that live between the rocks. The river is also home to so many pike cichlid species. The most amazing thing for me is how these cichlids care for their young, maybe longer than any other fish. Sometimes you see a pair that is leading around 10 to 12 centimeter long babies. They are already big enough to swallow most of the fish in their habitat, but still sticking close to mom guarded by as much as a full year or until she's ready to breed again. When you roll a rock in the river, the babies come in close because they want to grab small plecos, insect larvae or microinvertebrates that live under the rocks. You can basically hand feed these little monsters. Pike cichlids are ideally adapted to live in the fast water and there are five endemic species here in the rapids, Crenicicla anamiri, Dandara, Perkna and the undescribed species Shingu 1 and 2. Add another two endemic species in the headwaters and several that occur in the small creeks in the lowland basin of the Shingu. These Monkhausia are the most common fish in the Shingu. They are everywhere in the rapids and also one of the smaller fish found here, so they get eaten by just about everyone. Sometimes their schools are in the thousands of individuals, always swimming in the strongest current. They occasionally feed off the surface, but most of the time they simply wait for the current to bring small enough food into their school. When you turn a rock and expose a potential food source, many of them immediately come to investigate. Sound plays a huge role in the Shingu, and a person walking or moving things in the substrate immediately brings fish from all directions. Where there are crevices, there are fish in the Shingu. Every little crack is occupied by someone. This clip shows two of my favorite fish together. The first is Synaptolemus cingulatus. It is a small orange and black striped anastomid found in the rapids of other rivers in South America, but here in Shingu, it is really actually possible to observe them. Look how these little brightly colored fish venture away from the substrate. They have a mouth with lips like a star-nosed mole, and it turns upwards so they can feel around in the dark and feed on the overhang under the boulders. They will also swim upside down and feed from the bottom. And here you can see why they don't venture far, because the Shingu's most badass fish also hunts the shadows of these boulders. This is Crenicicla dandara. This totally black pike cichlid actually eats plecos. They are not uncommon in the river, but hard to spot, because they usually stay in those caves, or at least in the shadow of the rocks. A species of black pike cichlid occurs in many rivers, and they are always shadow hunters, and usually quite aggressive. When the females are courting, their stomach and midsection starts to first lighten into an orange band and eventually turns intense red, like a piece of charcoal that is red hot in the center. When the babies start to swim, the eyes of the females glow bright gold, which may also help the babies get oriented in the dark shadows that these fish prefer. 
the most common pleco in the Xingu is actually the gold nugget pleco. You have to imagine these like buffalo grazing on the plains. They sit in the shallow water on just about any exposed rock and feed on the bio cover. Like most plecos, they will slowly swim away when you get closer, but there are just lots of them. The big adults lose the nice yellow margins that juveniles have on their fins. And as you go upstream, the pattern changes from almost no yellow spots to very large ones. But all of these fish belong to the same species. This huge rapid is at the confluence of the Rio Iriri and the Xingu. Here you can see the river wheat plants that grow on the boulders. In the rainy season, all of these plants start to bloom. Then even the satellite photos of the river make it look hot pink. Many species of fish feed on and in these rubbery leaves. The Iriri is the major tributary of the Xingu and it has almost the same fish community as the Xingu, but it is very shallow and even more difficult to navigate. Everywhere you look in the Xingu, you will see anastomids, and not just leporinus, but all different genera. The tiger striped leporinus here is Leporinus tigrinus, and the ones with the huge upper lip and black and white flag on the tail are Leporellus vitatus. When you flip a rock in the river, they are often the first fish to show up and see if there's anything good hiding in the sponges. And yes, virtually every rock you turn over is covered in these white sponges. The Sarasalmids are a little bit more shy. You don't see piranhas every day in the river, even though there are several species. You do see lots of Meloplus, Meleus, Tomatus and others. The most rare and coolest of the Pacus is Osuptus shinguensis, the parrot Pacu. They are not in every rapid, and usually they live in places where the current is so strong it will pull the mask off your face. The same goes for the adult tomatoes. For some of the photos in the book, we actually had to hold the person taking the photos because the current where these adult pakus stay in the rapid is so strong you need both hands to hold onto the camera. This gang of cichlids are comprised of Retroculus shinguensis and Geophagus agirostictus and some Crinicicla species shingutu juveniles. They are all common fish in the river, and we spent hours going over thousands of photographs to decide which photo we wanted to use for each species. Our goal was not to just show the fish, but to have it doing something, to show some sort of behavior. So there are not too many photos of the fish flat against the background, and lots with motion, and the fish busy with something. We wanted to convey how all these fish interact, and maybe show some things you did not already know. For one, if you look at how dynamic all these habitats are, and just how much water movement there is, you can understand why these cichlids are quite demanding in the aquarium, because they need that high flow and oxygen saturation, but then they also need to eat a lot, which also means the water quality is a delicate balance. For the photographs, we used all natural light when possible. It is to show you the interplay of light and shadow. The river, with its dark rocks and light sand, creates this extremely contrasting lighting and is part of the reason we see those patterns reflected in the coloration of many of the fish. Behind the big rapids, you find these slack water zones. Some fish, like Hypancistris zebra or Bariancistris chrysolomus, prefer these habitats. They are often really cryptic. You don't see them out in the open at all. Where the river moves slow and water is flowing over a more shallow area, it is often full of fish, but some of the really colorful plecos are hidden deep in the horizontal crevices of the boulders, spend their entire life basically out of view. If you leave a camera out for a few minutes and disturb the bottom, many fish just show up, because there is so much competition for food here. Maybe we need to introduce the team as they enter the field. First up are Leporinus maculatus. These pick at the bottom, but they will open up a snail bit by bit, except they cannot crack the really large ones. I think only the stingrays can break those open. Leporinus tigrinus are more rare, but they school together with the maculatus. I think a lot of these anastomids will just travel together since they're quite similar in shape and pattern. Some minutes later, cichlid starts to show up. First are always Geophagus agirostictus, but also some big Crinicicla species too. The big pike cichlids just kind of assess the situation, and if anyone is not careful, they will grab them. But they are mostly after some plecos, crabs, leeches, or big insect larvae that get exposed by all this activity. You will also notice a single Hypomasticus julii. These really prefer bedrock and much faster flowing water. But because all these habitats have some flow, they will occasionally travel through this slower water to see what is happening especially if a bunch of fish are making noise and digging in the substrate. 
Rikon falcatus, Rikon species blacktail, and the occasional Munchausia swim in the open water above. These are all common fish, but they have to be careful in this kind of open shallow habitat, and most of the time they prefer to feed at the surface. Big male retroculus are noisy underwater, like a drunk stumbling into a bar. They pick up huge pebbles and spit them out, so quite often you hear them before they are in front of the camera. They are incredibly difficult to photograph because they are smart and somehow quickly learn where the front of the camera is. With a small stationary camera, they eventually get used to it and we get to see cool footage like this. I'm so happy that we got great photos of them for the book, not just showing this kind of feeding activity, but also of their nesting site and the babies. At the northern end of the Volta Grande, the big curve of the Xingu, the river falls down into the Amazon lowland. This is kind of the end of the journey for the Amazonian fishes that try to go up the Xingu, except for the huge migrating species. They can navigate these rapids. But a bunch of endemic Xingu species also occur below here, even the zebra pleco, and some others only start to occur here. This zone, because it is in the lowland, has much less water flow. The water is not as clear, and there are huge islands of boulders with plenty of fish. Well, I hope some of you now have some interest in our book. Get in touch with me from BelowWater.com or with either of us on social media to order. Make sure to share and like this video and subscribe to the channel. Over the coming months, there'll be lots of cool videos showing fish from the Shingu in nature.